used to be doing ancient research, but now it has broadened a lot, right? It's uh, everything that has to do with ancient planning, knowledge presentation, even machine learning, right? And um, so, and I, I first of course, something that we're doing now, uh, uh, Fabio, is to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of this land, uh, in particular the Wongurung and the Wongurung uh, from the Kulin Nations, which is the place we're gonna do, most of us are here, not you. And there's a tendency now to do this, recognizing that there's much more history than 200 years here. And so I, I invite you all to repay the respect to the elders, past and present and future. And in particular to learn and be aware of the challenges that are not just in the past, but they are currently today and a lot of injustices. So, um, so and then in, in this land and in this seminar, we have the pleasure, or I have the pleasure to introduce Fabio. Okay, uh, Fabio is an associate professor in La Sapienza University in a very famous group doing cutting edge research in, in computer science in a lot of areas, uh, you know, very famous in databases, AI, business process as well. Um, very, very important group, which Fabio is part of it. So you can, you can already say, uh, speak about his, uh, his depth, right, and breadth. Um, so he, he has caused a lot of papers in the main venues, each guy, AAAI, AIJ, etc. And his area is very similar to mine um, because his, his research intersects uh, um, knowledge representation, planning, and formal methods, okay? And, and his thesis, uh, remember, was about you know, applying simulation to the composition of services. And simulation is a notion from formal methods. Um, and composition, uh, automatic composition is a form of planning and services is, uh, you know, service-oriented computing is an area of computer science. Um, so anyway, I had the pleasure to work with him. And I, I met him so long time ago now, I think in, 19, in 2008, okay? Uh, when he was a student of uh, Professor Giuseppe Di Giacomo, um, who I've been working with him since I was a PhD student back in Toronto, okay, when I was a master's student in 2099. Okay. So if, if I have to say many thanks, many thanks to, to Giuseppe, and I'm very grateful for many, many things, but one of them was to introduce me to Fabio and to allow me to work with him while Fabio was a student there. Uh, and it's been an incredible journey for me uh, of fun and learning at the same time. His depth and breadth in computer science is uh, outstanding. Uh, and also is a very easy person to work with uh, um, along so many years and so many papers. So we have lots of emails and lots of interactions both in Italy and also here in Australia because Fabio visited us in, I think it was just in 10, Fabio? 2011. 2011. Yeah. So he came with an RMIT Melbourne Visiting uh, Award. And uh, so he was here, he knows Australia. He came here, I will never forget uh, his comparison between Lorne's, Lorne Water, right? The, the sea here and the Mediterranean Sea when he got in <laughs> and he realized that the temperature was a little bit different. Uh, we have also, you know, being both uh, Italian and Argentinian, we also share other things outside uh, computer science like football and the passion for gelato, which we have become much better at the second one at gelato than at soccer okay, <laughs> over the time. So <laughs> really it's been, it, it, and, and one, of the, one of the great, if there's any, uh, if there are only a few things that are positive about this pandemic is that we can do these uh, meetings. And so Neil invited uh, at the time someone as well from Europe, I would say, why don't we invite someone else like that? And so we have the pleasure to have Fabio here who's going to talk us about his latest work on um, doing LTL logic to applying it to problems in business processes. So there are some people here in the room that are from the business process community as well. So this is perfect. So without further ado, Fabio, I let you go with your slides. Thank you very much and we will enjoy your talk. Thank you, Sebastian. Let me say that it's been, it's been a pleasure for me as well to work to, to being introduced to you and work with you, of course, and I hope we will keep doing so in the future. Okay, so um, 
you can see the screen, you can see me, everything is right, okay? Right? Sebastian, is everything Perfect. fine? Perfect. Everything okay. is fine so far. Okay, so, um, yeah, this talk is about, uh, it's mainly about uh, planning based approach to the problem of uh, trace alignment. This is a problem that is not from my area of expertise, but it's an area that I have approached in the latest years. And uh, it has to do with the process mining, which is uh, broadly the analysis of business processes starting from event logs. What does it mean? Let's see what an event log is. An event log is a set of traces of, um, that represent the execution of some processes. So here on the right, you can see an example of log. Each of these blocks represents a trace. So here you have a sequence, as you can see, of activities, register requests, examine thoroughly, check ticket, and so on and so forth. This is one trace. Each of these is an activity, and each activity may have some attributes. Now, here we are mainly concerned with the activity itself, and we will basically disregard the other attributes, except for the timestamp, which will be of interest in the second part of the talk. Of course, for simplicity, we will abbreviate all these uh, activities with letters, so I will, will use a simple letter for each of them. So these activities, as they are executed in a process, they can be executed by uh, an automatic uh, actor or a human uh, operator. Um, as, they, as they come, essentially, as they are executed, they are recorded, they are uh, taken track of, and they build these uh, traces. A set of traces constitutes a log, okay? So process mining is the analysis of uh, processes starting from this log. What are the um, problems, uh, classical problems in process mining? Well, typical problems include process discovery, which is uh, the task, the problem of uh, discovering a process uh, given the set of uh, logs, the log it has produced, the set of traces it has produced. Another one is conformance checking, which is the problem of checking whether a log conforms to the process model. So you uh, analyze the log and you, say, and you can tell whether it's consistent with the process model. And then there is uh, monitoring or compliance monitoring, which is the problem of monitoring um, a trace of process under execution with respect to the process model. We will be uh, concerned with a form of conformance checking. Now, in um, process mining, you have essentially two ways, two, let's say, two approaches to um, describe the process. One is the imperative approach where you have prescriptive specifications. Essentially, you fully specify the process by some, uh, by some model. The simplest of these uh, is uh, finite state, state automata, but you could also use PetriNet, BPMN. This can be seen as essentially uh, languages for defining what the, the, um, what the, um, the process does and which define um, in a prescriptive way the traces of the process. On the other side, you have declarative process modeling, where, which, which adopts a descriptive approach. In this approach, what you do is uh, to provide a loose specification of the, of the process. And essentially, this is done by um, providing a set of constraints and by assuming that uh, any trace compliant with that constraint is a, a behavior of your process, is an allowed behavior, okay? In this picture, you see um, an illustration of, these, um, of the relationship between the two approaches. So here you see uh, the set of traces obtained from a uh, fully specified behavior. These ones here in light green represent the whole set of uh, um, traces that are described in a uh, declarative way. 
And then here you have the traces that do not meet neither, that do not satisfy neither the constraint nor are, um, come from the execution of a um, prescriptive specification. In this talk, I will stay in this area here, okay, which is the area of declarative process mining, which is process mining where you use an event log and you describe processes in a declarative way. Okay, now what is trace alignment? This is, like I said, it's a form of uh, conformance checking. And what is the problem? The problem is that uh, since uh, humans are involved in uh, the activities, these traces are often dirty, which means that they, they can contain spurious events or they may not contain some events that they should. And in general, these, uh, the traces which are produced, uh, let's say at execution time, may not be consistent with the process uh, in general for, uh, for a number of reasons. And the problem is that when there are these, uh, these glitches, um, the trace may not uh, enforce uh, the process model. So trace alignment is the, is the process of, is the problem of uh, cleaning these traces and repairing them. Repairing them means that uh, basically they are changed to uh, become compliant uh, with the process model. This, this is a fundamental problem that can be uh, used for many reasons. And in particular, they allow to identify trace errors and uh, consequently taking uh, corrective actions. Or um, another, another uh, use of it is uh, by measuring the deviation with respect to the process model. So you take the trace, you check whether it is consistent with the uh, process model. If it is not, you uh, find where the uh, problems are and then based on these, the glitches, the errors you have identified, then you can measure how far the, uh, the trace is from the process model. Now let's define a bit more precisely the, the problem. Um, uh, this is the declarative variant of the problem, it's not the original uh, specification, and this is the one we are using in this talk. So uh, the problem is the following. We are given a trace over a finite event alphabet. Events represent uh, the occurrence of some activity. So essentially sigma is the set of possible activities. Then you are given a constraint phi. For now, we do not stick uh, to any particular uh, formalism for representing the constraint. We will discuss this later. So let's say this is some formal constraint. And then you are given a cost function. This cost function associates uh, every change to the trace row with a cost. And in particular, we consider only two two kinds of changes of modifications, which are additions and deletions. Okay, so you basically associate a cost to adding a, um, an activity to the trace, an event to the trace, or deleting an event from the trace. Now, given this input, the task is that of finding a new trace, row primed, obtained as a modification of row by additions and deletions, that satisfies the constraint, which is written in this way. However, you don't want any trace that satisfies row, but you want a minimal cost trace. So the trace that is uh, obtained from row with a minimal number, sorry, with a minimal cost, okay? It's not necessarily the minimal number of changes because this depends on the costs applied to the changes. Okay, let's see shortly an example of uh, the problem of an instance. This is the input trace. Then you have a formal specification of this constraint. Whenever A occurs, B eventually occurs after A. Then let's assume for simplicity that all changes cost one. So there is no difference between adding or deleting and the cost doesn't depend on the actual event that's added. Now, you can easily see that uh, this uh, trace does not satisfy phi. And this is because uh, these two uh, A's do not have uh, a matching uh, B. Because we are requiring that after every A, 
eventually you see B. And these two do not have a matching B, in particular the last one doesn't have it. Okay, so what, what can you do? Well, you can change these uh, trays. You can add and delete events. So for instance, you can say, okay, good, I remove all, all A's. If you remove all, all A's, you obtain, the, you obtain these trays, C, B, C. And of course, because you have removed one, two, three, and four A's, the cost of obtaining these trays is four. Another option is to add B after every A. Okay, so you stay on the safe side and you, of course, you enforce the, the constraint. Ah, sorry, I forgot to say that in, in, in the first uh, trace, you are obviously satisfying the constraint because there are no A's occurring. And so the constraint is vacuously satisfied. In the other case, like I was saying, you can add B after every A. And of course, this enforces the constraint. And again, because you are adding one, two, three, and four Bs, the cost of this is four. Third option, of course, this, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, is to add B at the end only. If you add B at the end only, well, every A has a B, a matching B in the future. The cost is one, and this is, of course, uh, the solution. I mean, there cannot be any uh, solution, any other trace with a uh, smaller cost. Okay, so this is essentially the problem and this is what you want to do. Now notice that from row, by addition and deletions, you can uh, uh, obtain any trace. Okay, so you can arbitrarily, because you can simply delete the whole trace and then add all the events you would like to have in the trace. So this tells us that if this constraint is satisfiable, then a repaired, a repaired trace always exists. So you can always find a solution to the problem. However, like I was saying, the problem is that of finding a minimal cost solution. And as you can imagine, you cannot go over all the possible traces because they are infinitely many. And uh, second observations, uh, we can think of the uh, cost of obtaining a trace from rho as the distance that rho has from the constraint, okay? So how far this trace is from the region where the constraints are satisfied. Okay, what are the applications, uh, possible applications of uh, trace alignment? Well, you can um, check whether the uh, process, a process uh, is uh, enforced, and if it is not, you can quantify the deviation from the, the process, from the expected process. You can, of course, identify and correct the errors in the execution. And um, another use, uh, this is done in a different, uh, in a slightly different uh, version of the problem, is to identify common, pa common patterns among log traces. Okay, this is just an example, which will not be discussed here. Okay, but the problem is also interested, interesting in AI. Why? Well, because you can simply see these traces as the behaviors of an agent. When an agent is running, you can see these, uh, um, you can model its executions as uh, um, its behavior as a run where, for instance, the event modeled the executed actions. They could also model some other, some other properties, but let's say just for example, that this model the executed actions. And then you can use, you can essentially use trace alignment for tasks similar to those that we have seen above. Okay, you can check whether the observed behavior is actually compliant with your expectations. You can check whether there are discrepancies with the expected behavior and if possibly repair them. You can find uh, behavior patterns and so on and so forth. I mean, you can use the solution to the problem for several purposes. So we have this problem which originates in uh, business processes, but is also relevant to AI. Actually, we will see that it's also relevant to AI because uh, the, the best technique for this problem actually comes from, uh, I mean, it's based on uh, AI technology, in particular on planning technology. 
Okay, what I'm going to uh, talk with you about in this, uh, in this talk is to describe a technique for trace alignment, uh, which, is, uh, which has been described uh, in a um, publication, in a paper that we have published at AAAI in 2017 and that we are working on currently <coughs> uh, to extend it, which presents, uh, the paper presents an automata-based approach to trace alignment, which is solved with cost-optimal planning. I will describe also some experimental results and if, as I hope, uh, time permits, I will discuss briefly an extension that we are now uh, working on to metric, to metric temporal constraints. Okay, let's start now by detailing the um, language that we use for constraint specification. Now, a standard in uh, BPM, and in particular in the cloud BPM, is declare. Now, declare is essentially a temporal logic that is defined by templates. So you have certain templates that you apply by plugging the uh, events that you want to uh, that you want to talk about. So for instance, you have this template existence A which states that uh, event A occurs in the, in a trace. So for instance, this trace satisfy existence A because it contains uh, an occurrence, at least an occurrence of event A or of activity A, this, this trace does not satisfy existence A because uh, there is no occurrence. And then you have other similar, uh, other constraints uh, defined in a similar way. Another famous one, another common one is response AB, which states that if you see A, then you will see B in the future. Okay, it's the one we've seen before. And then you have other, this is an exhaustive list, you have, uh, I'm not wrong, like uh, something around 20 templates. Now, this language here, declare, is in fact a fragment of a linear temporal logic over finite traces, um, which is a larger language that includes uh, declare. And this is essentially, uh, let's say, the um, specialization of classical LTL to finite traces. Now, I will not go into the, the details. This is just to show you the syntax of uh, LTLF. For those of you who are familiar with LTL, it's essentially the same syntax. However, it talks about uh, finite, it's interpreted over finite traces. Let me tell you just these two operators, the, the other, these two operators, the other one are Boolean operators standard. So X next, um, X stands for next and means that uh, phi is satisfied by next event. Whereas uh, U stands for until and means that uh, in, there is uh, in the future an event that satisfies phi 2 and until then all events, all events until then satisfy phi 1. Okay, based on this, you can define some classical abbreviations, which are F phi, which stands for eventually phi, meaning that uh, in a trace, uh, an event that satisfies phi eventually holds, and always phi, which means that in a trace, all events satisfy phi. Like I was saying, you can rewrite all the uh, templates, all the declared templates as LTLF. So for instance, here you have the correspondence between some declared templates and their, uh, and their LTLF equivalent translation. In exist, for existence, translates as eventually A. Response, as you can see, translates as always A implies eventually B. Okay, this means whenever you see A in the future, you, see, you will see B, which is the uh, semantics we have described before. And then you can have other, I will not uh, detail them. Uh, and uh, we use LTLF, okay? So we are more general than declare only, but by um, dealing with LTLF, we are also dealing with uh, declare. Actually, we could even go beyond that. Okay, now this was uh, the example we'd seen before. As you see, um, this constraint actually captures this property. So whenever A occurs, B eventually occurs after A. 
always, whenever A occurs, the occurrence of A, sorry, implies that eventually B will happen. Okay, an interesting property of LTLF is that its formulas can be associated with a non-deterministic finite state automaton, A phi, that accepts exactly all the traces that satisfy the formula. Okay, so let's see some examples of this. So if you have eventually A, this is the automaton. Now a trace, we say that a trace is accepted by this automaton, uh, if and only if it satisfies phi. Okay, so let's see. You stay in a non-accepting state as long as the trace contains, does not contain A, the event is not A. As soon as you see A, you go to an accepting state, which is a sync state. So from which you will never escape with any uh, symbol. So this actually, it's immediate to see that this uh, accepts exactly all traces that contain at least A. Here you have always A. So you stay in an accepting state until you satisfy A. As soon as you see something that's not A, you end up in a sync non-accepting state. So this means that any trace which contains something that's not A will, uh, will not be accepted. And here you have the, uh, the automaton for always A implies eventually B. So you stay in the accepting state as long as you do not see A, as soon as you see A, you will go to a new state which is not accepting that you will um, live only by seeing B and ending up in, a, in an accepting state. So essentially every time you have some A and eventually B, you are accepting. Notice that if you, say A, if you see A and you never see B, you remain in an in non-accepting state. Okay, how does the uh, solution uh, work? Well, mm. we are given a trace and a constraint. We assume uh, without loss of generality that we are given only one constraint because if there are many, we can always put them in conjunction. So we can simply consider one constraint only. And then what we do, we define two automata. One is called the augmented trace automaton. It's a simple automaton obtained from rho that accepts all the modification to rho where the changes are marked. I will show an example shortly. The other automaton that we define is the augmented constraint automaton. This is obtained from the automaton for phi and it accepts all the traces and the modifications of rho that satisfy phi. Now, given these two automata, the task is to find a minimal cost rho prime, minimal cost trace with the possible changes, that is accepted by T, by sorry, T plus, which is the augmented trace automaton, and that is accepted by the augmented trace automaton. If you have a trace that is accepted by both of these, you have a trace that is a, a modification of rho and that satisfies phi, which is the trace we are looking for. Of course, we want to find a minimal cost such trace. Here you have an example of the augmented trace automaton. If you see, this is the input trace. See that the input trace is accepted by the augmented trace automaton by, let's say, this main path. Okay? And then this, auto this, let's say, this simple path is augmented with additions and deletions, okay? In every state, you can add any event you want, okay? And if you delete, you jump to the next state. What does it mean? Well, it means that a trace is accepted if it is a trace obtained from modifying rho. How do you do that? Well, let's see an example. How does... Uh, uh, how do you obtain the trace that removes all A's? Well, it's very simple. You delete A here, you delete A here, then you read C, you read B, you delete A, you read C, and you delete A. As you can see, this trace here, which represents the trace CBC obtained from rho, is accepted by this. 
And interesting, importantly, in this trace, you have all the changes explicitly marked, okay? And you can do the same for the other uh, traces that we've seen in the example, okay? For instance, you can add B at the end of the trace, okay? So you have A, A, C, B, A, C, and then uh, A, and then you have add B. Augmented constraint automaton. Like I said, this is the constraint automaton extended, augmented with deletions and additions, okay? In this case, you add A whenever you have, you add an event whenever the event occurs in the uh, original automaton. Here you add A and here you have uh, the original A and then you add uh, deletions on all uh, the states. Now notice that this, this automaton now accepts <clears throat> all the traces that satisfy phi and that are not necessarily modifications of the original trace, but it also accepts the traces that are modifications. Now, if we, re if we find, if we look for a trace that satisfies these and these, we are assured, and this ensures that we are looking for a trace that is a, a modification of rho. Okay? Now, finding a trace, searching for a trace that satisfies both is equivalent to searching for a trace that satisfies the product of these two. And the product is the standard product between NFAs. Okay? So here, if you see, this trace here is accepted by the trace automaton, but is not accepted by the constraint automaton because a, A, C, B, A, C, A. And as you see, you end up in a non accepting state. One way to repair it is to add B. If you add B from this state, you end up in an accepting state in the, in the in constraint automaton, and you stay in the accepting state in the trace automaton. Okay, so now the problem is that of finding a minimal cost trace that is accepted by these two. Okay, this can be done in, you can prove that this can be done in polynomial time with respect to the uh, sides of the trace times uh, two to the sides of the constraint, which means that essentially the technique is a polynomial with respect to the size of the trace and exponential with respect to the size of the constraint. Now the problem is, okay, we know what a solution, an optimal solution is, how to find it. Well, we can do this by applying uh, minimal cost planning. To do that, we have to uh, encode the problem as a, plan, as a planning problem. And this can be done essentially by um, encoding in the planning domain, the uh, execution of the product automaton and um, by requiring, by defining the problem as the product automaton starting in its initial state, which means that the trace automaton and the um, constraint automata start in their initial state, and then by requiring as a goal that all the, automata, all the automata end up in a final state. And then you want to find a minimal cost goal-reaching sequence of actions. Now, actions model, um, model sync, which means you read the character of the input trace without doing anything. And of course, model also additions and deletions, which have, of course, a cost, depending on the cost associated to the change. Okay, so essentially this sequence is the plan we are looking for, which represents the changes that we are making to the input trace. Okay, um, this is an example. Uh, each box here is a state of the domain. As you can see, initially, all the automata are in their initial state. Now, as you execute an action, which means you execute a sync, that is, you read an, an event without changing it. Well, all the uh, automata progress according to their specification, to their transition function. 
Okay, so for instance, you see that the first one on A uh, progresses to this state, the second one on A progresses to this state, and the third one on A progresses to this state. This is a new state of the product automaton. I have represented it. Uh, yes? Fabio can, Fabio, can I ask you a question, Sebastian, here? Wait, so can you go one slide before, very quick? So is this problem, so this A plus is not deterministic automata? None of them is deterministic. None of them is deterministic, but... Uh, the, the other one as well. No, the first one, yes, the traces. Is, is, is the, yeah, the traces, is, right? Yeah, the traces. Yeah. Uh, A but, plus but, is so this, this, but, but this is, this a, is not a deterministic yeah. planning problem. No, 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 it's deterministic because A plus is right. angelic. You are looking, I mean, it's like, it's like in, uh, in FSAs. You are looking for, just for a, just for a, a path. It's an, it's an, it's an angelic non-determinism. Okay. Okay, clear? Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, and I, uh, like I was saying, uh, essentially, this is the product automaton uh, represented in a factorized way to be more, Simple, to be simple. And the, 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 the path you see here is the path you obtain by executing A, C, add B here, and then uh, C. And as you can see, if this is the input trace, which is not accepted because there is no B, well, this is a possible trace, or if you wish, a possible plan obtained on this domain that satisfies the constraint. And the fact that the constraint, sorry, the constraints yeah, because these two are the, cons are the automata for phi 1 and phi 2. Now, the fact that these constraints are satisfied is represented by the fact that uh, they, are, they end up in their final states, in their, sorry, accepting states. So this is an example of uh, formulation of encoding in PDDL. This is not the encoding we have used in the paper, but it's uh, um, simple encoding to uh, read. Let me say that... Um, in general, as you can expect, various encodings are possible and that uh, each encoding uh, yields uh, different performance, okay? And this is why this was, this was the worst <laughs> performing encoding, but it's the best uh, readable one. Okay, we have done some experiments. We have tested uh, the approach with uh, two cost optimal planners, which are fast downward and uh, Simba star. We assume the unitary cost for additions and deletions. And we have compared the technique against some ad hoc state-of-the-art uh, solutions implemented in the toolkit uh, Pro-M. The data set we have used were a set of real-life logs actually taken from um, a log of uh, uh, loan applications in a Dutch financial institute. And this uh, contains uh, 16 constraints. And then a set of synthetic logs uh, with 10, 15, and 20 constraints. Now, these are the results for the real life log where the black plot represents uh, uh, the ad hoc solution. And as you can see, the other two are the, uh, our approach with Simba uh, star and fast downward. And as you can see, we have a better, much better scalability in these cases. As you see, this starts growing fast uh, rather uh, soon, whereas the blue line, which is fast downward, stays essentially constant and Simba grows and tends to uh, stay. Uh, and, and, and the growth essentially reduces as the, this is the number, the length of the trace, so the number of events in the trace. So as the trace becomes longer, um, essentially it seems that Simba approaches a plateau here. Similar results are obtained for the synthetic logs. Now the synthetic logs essentially are some logs obtained from, from traces that contain, uh, that are accepted by the uh, process, but which are then somehow uh, with some noise aided to make them not compliant with the process. And even in this case, we can see that the blue and the red line improve of March out, uh, actually outperform the uh, black line, even though for short traces, this difference is not, uh, um, is not uh, 
very uh, remarkable. When uh, uh, the number of constraints increases, uh, you see that uh, there is a huge difference in performance. Okay, so uh, the results we have obtained are an implemented uh, automata-based approach, which is actually available, uh, uh, which is actually available. You can see here the, where you can uh, download it from. This uh, approach is more scalable and more flexible than ad hoc solutions. And I say more flexible because you simply need to replace the planner to solve, uh, in order to solve the problem with a different uh, algorithm. And then we have found that uh, PDDL, the encoding, has a huge impact, okay? Although this is not, uh, um, actually we haven't studied this uh, in, uh, in depth, uh, but we are now doing it in an ongoing work. Let me say that uh, typically changing the encoding does not require a large computational effort. So you get great benefit at a very low cost. Now, as ongoing extensions, uh, we are now uh, extending these approaches, uh, this approach to uh, an even more expressive logic, which is LDLF, which is essentially LTLF with uh, regular expressions, which is as expressive as finite state automata. We are testing the new encodings, like I was saying before, and we are studying, <clears throat> actually in a, a recent submission, the decidability of the problem for uh, the metric time, the, the, the time metric extension of LTLF. Now, let me talk a little bit about this last point since I have some time. Now, um, we have, like I was saying, we have uh, disregarded the, the, the attributes of the activities, one of which is a timestamp. Now, let's put it back in the, in the game. If you do that, you have uh, the timed version of trace alignment. What is this? It's essentially the same as a trace alignment with, a small diff with two small differences, which have a huge impact on the setting. The first one is that events are paired with a timestamp. And the second one is that constraints involve, pro that constra that you can, constraints involve properties that talk about uh, these timestamps. Let me show you an example. Now, the trace is no longer A, A, C, A, C, B, but it's a trace where each event is associated with a timestamp, which is the time where the event occurred. And of course, now the constraint talks about these timestamps. So for instance, you can say, whenever A occurs, B eventually occurs within two time units. Costs are as before, and there is no dependence on time. And you can see that this trace does not satisfy the constraint because these two um, events do not have a matching B within two time units. Notice that this guy here is matched by B because this is uh, um, far less than two time units from this, but uh, none of these two is matched by this. Okay, now the extension is very simple because metric temporal logic is essentially the same as LTLF. Of course, the syntax changes because you have to introduce these time intervals, but it's a, a, very, a very similar logic, except that you can express what you could express before <coughs> together with the time constraint. I will not get into the, the logic, but let me show you how you can encode this constraint here. Well, you can say that at every time point, at any time, sorry, uh, at every event occurring at any time, if the event is A, then eventually within two time units, B, event B must occur, okay? You see, you can essentially add these intervals to the temporal operator. Okay, you can use a similar approach to that of, uh, that we have seen before, which is an approach based on the use of automata, except that now <clears throat> MTLF formulas do not, uh, are not captured by 
simple NFAs by finite state automata, but they are mm, represented, they are captured by a, a more involved uh, class of automata, which are one clock alternating timed automata. Now, the problem with this is that they have essentially, they are infinite branching and infinite state. And then we cannot simply uh, plug this automata in the, in the technique we have seen before, and then everything works. Okay, it's not like that, unfortunately. And this is actually, this poses a major technical challenge to the problem. Now, uh, we know that this formula is decidable, which means that uh, we can check whether the constraint has a solution, but this is not what we want because we want to find an optimal trace, okay? And to do that, we ideally have to uh, explore, we have to uh, traverse, we have to explore all the possible traces, which of course cannot be done because we have, I mean, cannot be done directly on this uh, automata because uh, of infinite branching and state infiniteness. I avoid the details, but we have solved this problem by through an abstraction approach. So we started from an automaton like this, which as you can see is infinite branching and has infinitely many states. And by relying on previous results, we have devised a technique which tells us that we can work on a finite fragment of this. Essentially, we can produce a finite abstraction of this uh, automaton that uh, essentially contains all the information needed to find an optimal solution, okay? And this abstraction is obtained uh, by the combination of two results. The first one is a result from Wachnin and Worrell, and it's the result about the decidability of the logic, where a computable abstraction, um, sorry, a technique for computing for effectively computing an abstraction of these was uh, defined. And the second one <clears throat> is a uh, classical result about well-structured transition systems, which are system that enjoy certain, these are infinite uh, systems, infinite transition systems that enjoy certain structural properties, which I will not discuss here, but essentially, these two uh, results together allowed us to come up with these, uh, with these abstraction and to uh, prove that uh, the search is effectively, uh, you can effectively perform the search for the optimal trace, okay? And with this, you have essentially, once you have done that, you have essentially the same approach as for the basic version except that now you work on the abstraction of the automata, except uh, instead of working with the plane automata. Little detail is that uh, the complexity is non-primitive recursive, which essentially means that the technique is non-elementary. Non-elementary means that you have a tower of exponentials, okay? That you cannot fix, whose height is not fixed a priori. Okay, so let me summarize the results that we have on time trace alignment. <clears throat> First one is uh, we have formalized the problem as path search <clears throat> on a one clock alternating timed automaton. We have proven that the problem is solvable and we have characterized the complexity. Like I was saying, unfortunately, the complexity is non-primitive recursive. Let me say a couple of comments about complexity. Now, in the untimed version, we have an exponential complexity with respect to the size of constraints. However, in practice, as we have seen, we have a nice behavior. And this is essentially due to the fact that the constraints are typically small. And the fact that uh, apparently the worst case does not show up frequently in practice, okay? Now let's see what happens in the time version. We have a non-elementary, um, we have a non-elementary complexity. Again, the constraints are small, uh, are in practice are small. Oh, sorry. 
the, the constraints are small in practice. <clears throat> However, we don't know what is the impact in practice because we haven't uh, implemented uh, the approach yet. Of course, we can expect that this will have a huge impact on uh, the uh, performance. Let me say, however, that there exist examples of tools that have non-elementary constraint, non-elementary non non complexity, but that we uh, behave well in practice. And this is the case of Mona, which is a tool for translating uh, <coughs> monadic uh, second-order logic formulas into uh, DFAs, and has been shown to have acceptable performance in, pra in practice. So this tells us that at least we have some hope to see some uh, results practic uh, of, of practical interest. Okay, let me uh, sum up. We have started from a problem that, uh, that originates in declarative process mining, but which is of practical and speculative interest also to AI, and in particular to, uh, in the context of agent uh, behavior. We have considered uh, the two variants, uh, untimed and timed, and we have shown that uh, through an AI planning technique, we can obtain excellent results in the untimed setting. Plus, we have shown that the time setting is solvable, <coughs> but uh, the uh, practicality has to be assessed. Now, as future and uh, ongoing work, I would say, <coughs> we have the following, um, some, some possibility for future work, are the extension of the untimed version to uh, the uh, more expressive logic LDLF, and this is ongoing. We are preparing a submission for this. Now, we could uh, start in the timed version, instead, we could uh, think of studying well behaved fragments of MTLF, which do not yield uh, an unelementary complexity, or we could also consider uh, the effect. I mean, the effects on performance of constraining the repairs. So of constraining the changes that you can make to the input trace. So for instance, we could say, what happens if we fix the number of additions and deletions between two events? It remains to implement the solution approach for the time variant, and it could be planning based once we have performed the abstraction. And finally, this is a longer term goal, is to consider the data aware uh, setting. The data aware setting is essentially where the activities carry a payload. So something additional with respect to the timestamp. Essentially, the activities have some attributes, the events carry a timestamp and additional attributes with them. And this would be particularly relevant to the knowledge representation area in AI. Okay, so that's it, and uh, thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm here for to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, no, need it, need, 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 yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so you are over there, right? Yeah. So I don't know if you want to try the, the questions. If anybody in the audience has any questions, thank you, Fabio, for this. It was very good, and I think at the right level. Thank you. So, anybody? Yeah. 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 So there's a question, Tim. Yeah. Tim. Tim. Okay. Made a, uh, but I don't know. Okay. Let's see if you can. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Ah, there we go. I mean, yeah, I, we can I, hear you, Tim. Yep. Oh, Thanks, Fabio. Um, that that was very interesting. Uh, how, how does I'm not quite familiar with so sort of the, the the LTL syntax anymore. How, how do you deal with um, like concurrent events? Is that possible? Um, no, I mean you have to you, you work with interleaving. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you can. That's so, but yeah, yeah. Okay. So, there is no explicit concurrency. Yeah. In, uh, in so, but uh, so effectively, I could take one of the the imperative process things like a petri net and convert it into an nfa and do the same thing right yeah right right yeah. okay good well i mean we have um, let me think uh no no sorry sorry okay if that's what you mean you could take a petri net and translate it into a set of ltlf constraints 
And these constraints, um, yeah. these constraints, yeah, let me think. Yeah, I think you can, you can express by, I mean, you cannot uh, express concurrency within each single uh, LTL formula, but by putting them together, you can deal with, uh, okay. with, uh, you can deal with um, concurrency. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. But, uh, uh, but Fabio, can, can, can you have in declare saying, you know, that uh, two actions happen at the same time? Can you yeah, you, well, you can do events. No, 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 no. In, uh, in declare, you cannot because the templates do not allow you to do that. But exactly. uh, the templates are restricted. But Sebastian, this would not be meaningful because uh, log traces contain only one event at each uh, state. They are not exactly. uh, property <laughs> interpretation like you are thinking. No, like no, exactly. That, 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 uh, that was going to be my follow up because the trace, the log has a timestamp, even if it is one second is, or two seconds, it will be. However, Sebastian, if you think uh, of the uh, data aware setting where you have events with attributes, then you can associate propositions with uh, attribute values, and then it would be more general. All right. Yep. Okay. So, Anybody so, on the floor? Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask you, because uh, in the met metric temporal logic, uh, it, it feels like you could reason about intervals and that you could use uh, simple temporal networks, for example, to do the temporal reasoning. So I, I don't know if, if that might help anyway to, to remove the infinity of, of possible traces. Mm, I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I, I mean, we, we have what we've done, we have worked with the tools, uh, with the theoretical tools we had. Uh, because we were mainly concerned with uh, um, decidability. So, right. and we found uh, this technique, we found it's decidable. Now, once we know that uh, the problem is decidable, yes, we can, I mean, I take this as a suggestion. We can look into it, uh, let's say at, implement at implementation time. I mean, now we are, we are the next step. We are going to implement the technique so a temporal network might be the tool to use, but we haven't, we haven't thought of it uh, yet. But I mean, thanks. Uh, it could be actually uh, one possible way to go. Yeah, no, because ch checking the consistency is, is cheap, let's say. Computationally cheap, so that, that might help. But what is, uh, uh, yeah, although you have to see the expressive power, I mean, uh, if, yeah, that, that's uh, true. you have to check that temporal networks allow for, um, actually capturing the constraints, the properties you can express with uh, in MTLF. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good point. So, can I ask a question from me? Sure, go, go, go sure. ahead. Can you give me the microphone, Nick? Here? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm getting uh -huh. there. Half an hour, I'll be there. Uh, half an hour, I bring it, I wait for you. So, Fabio, um, in one of your uh, future work, you talk about uh, putting constraints on the, uh, I was going to ask that question, and then you had it in the future work. Uh, the second one, the second second, so the second or in the second one, uh, effects on constraint of repair, which is, you know, one of the advantage of this is that it's very elaboration tolerant, right? You can do with a PDL a lot in a very declarative way. Sorry, but, it's about so this, talking about here, constraints on repairs, right? Yes, yes. So let's mm -hmm. suppose I want to express certain constraints on repair. Wouldn't that be yet another automata on the add and delete tokens? So you say, you know, I can write the LTL formulas on the add and delete tokens. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then express my constraint there saying, for example, that they could not be two adds uh, consecutively. Or that uh, eventually if you add this, you have to delete something else. Yes, but you could do that. But the idea of that, um, I mean, it's still an idea. It's something we have to explore. But the idea of that uh, is to limit the, so the problem is this. Because you have timestamps, you can add uh, an infinite number of, uh, you can essentially add an infinite number of new activities with, uh, uh, which are dense, because these are essentially, these timestamps are rational, okay? So within, oh, okay. So, yeah. Between yeah, two events, the, yeah. 
an infinite number. So the purpose of these constraints is to make this finite. Okay? okay. But in, and then you in the non time of infiniteness right, right away. Mm -hmm. That's right. In the non time version, in the first version, right? When there is no time. In the untimed version. In the untimed, in the untimed version, version. You don't have this problem, Sebastian. Yeah. I mean, you could do that to increase performance, but of course you would lose uh, some uh, power. However, there is no need to do that because uh, it's finite. Uh, everything is finite. And then uh, in some sense, you have a small model property. So if you have a solution, you have always a solution that is uh, within a certain bound. And you can compute this bound from the automata. No, but, but wait, 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 maybe I'm not understanding this. So mm -hmm. you, in the first part of your talk, you, yeah. without time, right? Yes. You had a trace, you have the declared rules of the process, right? right? What I'm saying, or maybe I got it wrong, is that you can easily, out of the shell right away, add a third automata, which puts constraints on the add and delete actions, right? What kind of constraint? constraint? Well, the one you say, you, you say, you know, uh, whenever you add, you cannot add uh, two consecutive actions, or you know, uh, okay. uh, or you cannot, mm -hmm. yes, if, you add, if you add an action, you have to eventually delete some other action. Okay, yes, yes. you could do that. Mm -hmm. So these are new declare, uh, say, new LTL specifications, but right. on the language, on the language of your repairs. Right? So I don't know. I, to tell you the truth, yeah. I don't know if this makes. I don't know. Yes, yes. I don't know if this makes any sense on the BPM community, right? Oh, I think, if, mm -hmm. right? But um, but one of the advantage of your framework, I think, is the flexibility that you can elaborate and you can express many things, right? Uh, yes. You can put pre course. preconditions on add and delete. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you want, okay. If I get it right, if you want to explicitly express certain constraints on repairs, you can do that. Easily, it's, out of the box, with what you have yes, already. In, yeah, it's already dealt with. It's okay. really an epsilon. It's really an epsilon. Uh, like you, I don't know if it makes sense uh, in the BPM uh, setting, but uh, may maybe it does. Uh, maybe it does. Uh, I don't know, you don't want to, let's say you want to put a limit to the distance uh, I mean, you say, if I have to make more than, 10, uh, more than 10 repairs, then I do not consider this as an acceptable solution. And so you could uh, encode it in, the, in, the, in your problem, and uh, this would uh, automatically tell you there is or, no solution. For or, or, le or, or let's say that you can say, you know, uh, some parts of your trace are fixed. They cannot be changed because, you know, you have uh, evidence that they happen mm -hmm. like that. Right. So, uh, right. you know, you say, you know, the prefix up to the action number 10, you cannot change it. Sure, sure, sure. You can do that. Yes, yes. So that is... I already know this is... Yes, 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 yes. I already know this is uh, as it is. It cannot be touched, of course. So, yes. Which is one of the advantage of your thing, right? Rather than uh, get, uh, modifying your algorithm, everything, you modify the encoding mm -hmm. in a very elaborate, in a, in a very elegant way. That's what I'm saying. Yes, yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Good. Sure. Good. Thank you. Okay, so I think Fabio has to go to teach. Um, so <laughs> if there are other questions, I can answer. But yes, what I mean. I still have some. Uh, okay, some so, so there, there is one question. Uh, uh, thank you, Fabio. Uh, I just have a question for for this uh, alignment. So if you align align a trace to your automated model or to a patch net. Uh, do you have any techniques to identify is this action have more weight than the other action? If you, you want to delete one or you want to add another one. So are you equally treat this action as an equal cost or you can have different costs for different actions? No, in general, you can have different costs. I mean, in the example, I've used the unitary cost, but in the general setting, and this is this can be dealt with uh, without any change in the general setting you have a cost function which associates a cost to each addition actually you can even be finer and associate uh, well besides associating different costs 
<coughs> to a different sand deletions, you can also associate different costs to additions and deletions of specific events. So you yeah, could yeah. say adding A costs more than deleting B, but also adding A costs more than adding B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Is, uh, in this respect, it's completely general. Okay. Although, of course, for simplicity, we have used the unitary cost. Now, let me say that, uh, of course, if you, if you have unitary costs are a very special case because uh, when you have unitary cost, you can search for shortest solutions. Yeah, okay. uh, so is this a cost no. function associated with the uh, Petrinet, with the uh, automated model, or is associated with this, uh, uh, I don't know, this uh, alignment technique? So, so, I mean, I, so I mean, when you built your Petrinet, have, did you also encode this cost in your Petrinet or in your uh, automated model? No, no, we do not use the Petrinet. I mean, if you give me a Petrinet, first thing I do, I translate it into a set of constraints. And it, this is already, I mean, this is already a, a big step that you have to take because uh, um, you may not be able to fully capture the Petrinet. Actually, I don't know, maybe you are, but I, I didn't think of that. So the technique doesn't deal directly with the Petrinet. You, it deals with, you have to, we are in, the, in a declarative uh, setting, so you have to, think that your process is represented by a set of constraints. If you are given uh, as input, if you are given a Petrinet, you must take care of uh, uh, translating it into a set of constraints or approximating it uh, as good as you can. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, on that note, wouldn't you be able to just, um, uh, for example, if you can encode the Petronet directly uh, into a planning problem and just solve it the same way? So doing the product between the Petronet and the automaton? Uh, so so keeping track on the, on the progress of the Petronet. Yes, the Petronet. Uh, yes, that's a good point. So in general, the technique, uh, yeah. So we start with a set of constraints, but uh, we could completely skip this part and work directly with the finite state automata. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if you're given a Petrinet, you could, you could translate it into a finite state automaton. Notice that this is an exponential uh, step. Right. And uh, because that would be essentially the reachability graph of the Petrinet. But right. yes, you could do that. So instead of using uh, these, uh, this automaton, you could represent, sorry, instead of using a set of constraints, of declarative constraints, you could directly specify the, the automaton. And then you would, essentially, you would skip the part where you produce this, okay? The part where you translate the formulas into automata. You are already given the automata and you work with them. So, here, you would work with the trace automaton and then with the automaton that represents your Petrinet. Mm -hmm. You could do that uh, directly, yes. Cool. Yeah, good, Th thanks a lot, Fabio. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think that there is no more question in, in here, it's in the floor. Uh, someone from the from from Zoom from online, the participants. Okay. So, uh, Fabio, one more question. Remember mm -hmm. the work that we did with Andrea, right? Yeah. But, uh, so, right. So you have introduced here the automatas, which makes everything so much nicer, right? Uh, yeah. The the actions. So we were adding and deleting, I remember, but in an ad hoc way, right? Yeah, you are we did it uh, per template. You did that per template. Correct. So exactly. So you do, you, you, uh, uh, leveraging on the automata, you basically do add and delete and that's it. 
you do other yes and actually uh, now connecting to the question by near and also to yours of course the approach is more general not only because you can use ltlf but because like i said you can use any automaton and in fact when i said that uh, you can extend it to ldlf which is ltlf with the regular expressions you can do that exactly because ldlf is captured by finite state automata it's as expressive as finite state automata so um, yes i mean you gain generality correct yeah yeah because that's essential we need, you know, that's the leap yes. that's the leap we we made from uh, the previous work Anyway, that, okay. I think that's okay near there. Yeah, so yeah. I, Fabio, I thank you very much that you agreed to do this. I know thank it's you for a nice time. No, I it's have a to say that to have you. It's really a pity I could not come there. Yeah. I mean, I cannot say I'm glad to be here, okay? <laughs> so so Nir, Nir is promising everyone who gives a talk here to bring them back to Australia. Yeah, yeah that's okay. it. Yeah, yeah. Eventually, but eventually, with a diamond. Eventually, eventually. Exactly. We don't, <laughs> and, we, and it's not desirable. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have can a time put, interval. Can so, I put an in, uh, time interval now? No, you, you cannot. We are not that expressive. That's uh, non elementary, as you show. Um, anyway, there are witnesses. So, there are witnesses near. <laughs> so, no, really, uh, as I said, it's been a pleasure to work with you, and it's a pleasure to have you here after so many years, and, and that the Australian community can. You know, uh, take advantage of this uh, possibility. So, thank you very much. Uh, good luck with your teaching now. And thanks everyone for joining here in Melbourne Uni. Sorry, Nina, I couldn't join you there. Um, Next time. Uh, yeah, and I think it was uh, great. Um, thank you very much. Good. Bye. Thanks, Fabio. Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Okay. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Ciao, Fabio. Uh, Ciao, Sebastian. Send, send regards to the Italian folks, the Italian group. Thanks, Nir. <laughs> you also great right. uh, people there. Thanks. Ciao. Thanks. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.